Welcome uh, to this uh, second day of activities. Um, today we uh, have a very exciting day. We have uh, two excellent speakers in the morning, uh, Laurent de Villet and Hermano Fried. So I really hope uh, you enjoy uh, their talks. So thanks for, for being here, Laurent. Uh, he's going to talk about new estimates on Landau collision kernels for Columbic interactions. Okay, so thanks a lot and thanks to all the organizers for this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, so uh, I'm currently in the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Cachan, but uh, in September I will be in University Paris 7. And uh, I want to speak today about uh, a problem uh, which is described in actually uh, three different papers, and I wanted to say that uh, actually one of them, the second one, has been done in collaboration with uh, Kleber Carapatoso, who is a Brazilian postdoc in my institution, in the Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, de, de Cachan. And uh, the second one, Ling Bing He, is a professor at uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. So let me uh, first introduce the uh, Lando collision kernel. So actually, the context is the following. In the, in the 30s, uh, Lev Lando wanted to write down uh, a collision operator which, would be, um, which could be used for plasmas, that is uh, a medium in which you have uh, charged particles. And uh, what existed at that time was uh, a collision kernel for uh, neutral gases. And this was discovered by uh, uh, Boltzmann and Maxwell in the, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, and uh, Lando uh, provided a certain number of uh, physical argument uh, to uh, establish this kernel that you can see here, and I will, that I will uh, now uh, fully describe. So the idea is to look at the density of charged particles uh, with respect to the uh, velocity v, which is the a number, I mean a vector which is in R3, and um, basically the idea is that the collisions will happen at a given point of space, so space is not present in the uh, collision operator, okay? It's an operator which acts only on the velocity variable v. And it writes like this. So as you can see, this is quadratic in terms of f. And um, this reflects the fact that only binary collisions are taken into account in this, uh, in this operator. You can also see that you have an integral part in the operator. You have this integral with respect to this parameter w here. And this is due to the fact that you look at the effect on the, on, on the density, let's say, of electrons in the plasma. And uh, you call V the velocity of a typical particle. And this particle will collide with a particle of velocity W. And so you have to integrate over all possible uh, second partner in the, in, in the collision. And so this is why you have this, this integral term here. And finally, as you can see, you have uh, two derivatives. So you have a divergence here and a gradient here. So actually, this operator is a second order uh, operator in terms of derivatives. So it looks more or less like a Laplacian and we will see uh, in the sequel what is the exact relationship uh, with, uh, with the Laplacian. And uh, this is really a big difference with respect to what happens when you have neutral uh, particles, when you have a, a standard gas, because in that case you have the Boltzmann operator which is a purely uh, integral operator, whereas here you have a mixture of integral and uh, differentials, okay? So all in all, you have a quadratic operator which is integral differential, okay? So now let me say a few things about the inner structure that you have here. So as you can see, you have a first term here with it, which is of second order in terms of derivatives, and then you have a drift term that is something which is first order in terms of derivatives. But this is written in, in this form um, in a way which is, in fact, uh, quite symmetric with respect to the, to the uh, uh, density f uh, of particles. 
Um, and uh, so uh, this is a vector, and you will multiply this vector here by a matrix. So here A is a matrix which depends on V minus W, which is the relative velocity uh, of the two particles which will enter in a collision. And uh, this matrix is made in the following way. It is a multiplication uh, of a scalar function of V minus W, more precisely of the modulus of V minus W, by a matrix here, which is nothing but the projection matrix onto the uh, orthogonal of Z, that is V minus W. So you have the projection on the orthogonal of V minus W multiplied by a number, and um, in the computation by the, uh, due to Landau, uh, this number is exactly 1 over z, that is 1 over modulus of v minus w. Okay? So the fact that this is exactly equal to this is really a consequence of the fact that you have uh, an interaction between the particles which, is, uh, which has a potential which is like 1 over r. Okay? This is directly related to that. If you had a different uh, interaction, you would, you, would find some, you would find something else here, okay? So uh, this, uh, this kernel here um, describes the effect in a plasma of the collisions, of the binary collisions between um, typically two ions or two electrons. And uh, actually this model is, uh, uh, has been widely used uh, uh, in, in the numerical codes for uh, solving, uh, uh, for, let's say, simulating plasmas. And to be more precise, the typical plasmas that you, that you can uh, uh, model with, uh, with this kernel here are the plasmas which are rarefied, which means somehow that uh, you will look at the density of electrons which at time t are at point x and have velocity v, rather than to macroscopic quantities such as the density, temperature, and uh, average velocity, mean velocity uh, of, the, of the particles. Uh, also, the plasmas have uh, to be hot, which means that a significant part of the particles have to be ionized. This means that the probability of collisions between two ionized uh, uh, atoms uh, is, uh, uh, is significant, whereas in uh, cold plasmas, you have a very small part of the plasma which is ionized, and so most of the collisions uh, happen between two neutrals or one neutral and uh, one charged particles. And finally, of course, the plasma has to be collisional, which means that the, uh, it has to be uh, sufficiently dense, so this is in some sense opposed to rarefied here, so there is a, let's say, range of densities such that it is rarefied in the sense that I uh, described earlier, and still collisional, that is the, the uh, uh, typical length uh, that uh, an electron will go without colliding uh, is not too large with respect to the uh, typical um, size of, of the plasma that you're considering, okay? So this uh, typically happens uh, when you're uh, studying fusion, nuclear fusion, and especially in the case of uh, uh, fusion by uh, uh, confinement with lasers. Okay, okay so uh, maybe let me write on the blackboard the, uh, the kernel because I will use it later on. So with the notations that I have taken, it's really like this. Okay. So uh, there is another presentation of the of the same kernel. Uh, which is sometimes called the uh, parabolic form of the kernel, but it's completely equivalent to this one. And it consists in, in, in really writing things like divergence of something times gradient of f plus something times f. And of course, these uh, two things have to be linear with respect to f since they 
collision operator is quadratic. And you can write it this way. So here you have a convolution with A and B. And A is uh, still the projection matrix multiplied by this function psi, which is just 1 over Z. And B here is actually the divergence of this matrix in this sense here. And so you find this minus 2 uh, Z divided by modulus of Z to the square times psi of Z. And as you can see here, uh, remembering that psi is equal to this quantity, uh, the A, uh, which appears here, uh, typically behaves like 1 over Z when Z is close to 0, whereas the B behaves rather like 1 over Z squared when Z is close to 0. So as you can see, the singularity when Z is close to 0 is much, uh, uh, much more dramatic when you consider the, the drift term uh, than when you consider the diffusion term. And so because of that, Actually, it's, uh, it's somehow uh, misleading to, to look at this, at this form here of the kernel because you are tempted to think that this is a dominating part in some sense, but because of the extra singularity that you have here, uh, somehow these terms is as bad as this one. Okay. So we will uh, discuss this uh, again a little in the, in the sequel. There is yet another uh, possible formulation. So here I've written it only in the case when psi is equal to, the, to this 1 over z. And uh, it's written really like this. So it really looks like Laplacian f plus constant times f square. But actually, once again, it's a little dangerous to see it uh, in this way because the, the, the matrix that you have here is really quite far from the identity. So somehow, uh, this term here is not really like a Laplacian and, and to try to use a method that you, that you know about the nonlinear heat equation uh, does not really lead to, to, to something interesting when you look at this, uh, at this operator here. Okay. So uh, let me now explain uh, the relationship between this operator and the uh, standard Boltzmann operator of... Uh, of kinetic theory. So here I have written down the, uh, the Boltzmann operator uh, such as it was written by Boltzmann in the, in the 19th century. And uh, this is also exactly the same formula as the one which was presented yesterday uh, by Professor uh, Hundertmark. And uh, I will not really detail uh, too much what is here, but what I want to say at this level is that uh, you have uh, in, the, in the cross section which appears in this operator a certain function here which depends on an angle. And when uh, you concentrate this uh, function on the angle uh, zero, then the collision is said to be grazing and this means somehow that uh, the velocities after the collision are extremely close to the velocities uh, before the collision, okay? And uh, if you do this asymptotics, and so you put this uh, cross-section here in the Boltzmann operator and you let epsilon go to zero, then you end up exactly with the uh, uh, operator of Landau. And so there is really a link, a mathematical link between the, the theory of the Boltzmann operator and the, and the theory of the Landau operator. And uh, you can sort of, uh, one way of understanding the operator consists in finding epsilon independent properties of the of the uh, uh, Boltzmann operator. However, the, 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 there is something which appears when you, when you look at this asymptotics. It is that depending on what you put at the level of the Boltzmann operator here, in terms of functions of uh, V minus W, that is the uh, relative velocities between the two incoming particles, you can end up in the, in the Landau operator with something which is not uh, the one over the, uh, the case when gamma is equal to minus three, which was the original case of the Landau operator for charged particles. So let me explain this. Um, if you look at the asymptotics from the Boltzmann to the Landau, you can end up with any kind of function psi at this level. So the Coulomb interaction corresponds exactly to the case when psi is equal to z to the gamma plus 2, with gamma is equal to minus 3, okay? So in that case, you recover the, 
uh, uh, the operator described by Landau. But you can get all the other cases if you take uh, gamma between, uh, let's say, uh, 0 and minus 4, or 1 and minus 4. So I don't want to tell you really why uh, you want to look at uh, this range uh, of gammas, but let's say that it covers all the, all the known cases uh, of interactions between uh, neutral gases. And so, because of this link between the Boltzmann and the Landau operators, the mathematicians uh, have uh, studied also the Landau operator in the cases when psi is equal to this function with various gamma. Okay? So, what you have to, to, to keep in mind here is that the real physically interesting operator corresponds to the cases when gamma is equal to minus 3, but all the other cases are also reasonable uh, in the sense that there are limits of the Boltzmann collision kernel, and it happens that the mathematical theory uh, becomes more and more difficult when gamma is uh, decreasing. And uh, this makes sense because the singularity that you will have in uh, Psi is, uh, of course, uh, worse and worse when gamma is uh, decreasing. Okay? So it is not, uh, it is not uh, surprising that uh, we have better results when we look at hard potentials, that is gamma between 0 and 1, or Maxwell molecules, that is gamma is equal to 0, than when gamma is, be is negative, like in moderately soft potentials, that is between minus 2 and 0, and even worse when uh, you have very soft potentials, which means that gamma is between minus 4 and minus 2, and especially in the case of the Coulomb interaction, which is interesting case in which you have minus 3. Okay, so all of this to tell you that a lot of results exist for the models which are not physical, and of course it's much more difficult to get to the really uh, physically uh, interesting model. Uh, let me say uh, that this operator naturally appears in an equation, so if you look at a plasma in which the density in terms of velocities is the same for all points x of the space, this is called a spatially homogeneous plasma, uh, then you just look at the equation df over dt is equal to the operator uh, taken at f at, point, at time t, sorry. Uh, and if you look at especially in homogeneous plasma, then you have to add the so-called advection term here, which just tells you that particles go in straight lines if no force is acting on them, okay? So this is sometimes called the especially in homogeneous Landau equation. But in this talk, I will speak almost exclusively of the spatially homogeneous one. Now, from the mathematical point of view, the first thing to do is to try to understand uh, what are the a priori estimates for, the, uh, for this equation, for the spatially homogeneous Landau equation. And in order to do that, uh, in fact, you have to find uh, a first weak formulation for the for the operator, and actually this weak formulation writes like this, and I will just uh, show you how this works. So remember that Q is defined by this formula, and A here is a multiplication of a function psi, which in the interesting case is just modulus of V minus W to the minus one, multiplied by a projection matrix onto the orthogonal of V minus W, okay? So now if I multiply by a function, by a test function, so this is a function of V, I multiply it by a test function of V. As you can see, you do an integration by part with the uh, divergence here, and you end up with Uh, here, the matrix, so this is a symmetric uh, matrix, and it acts as a symmetric uh, matrix, as a quadratic form, if you prefer, on this vector here, and let's write it with this notation, and on the vector gradient phi of V, okay? 
and you have now two integrals. Okay, I just made one integration by part. And now you observe that this part is symmetric if you change V uh, in W and W in V, because this, in fact, depends only on the modulus. And this part here is anti-symmetric. Okay, if you change V, uh, sorry, this is W. If you change V in W and W in V, this is anti-symmetric, and so, if you make this change of variables, that is V becomes W and W becomes V, then you will get here minus gradient phi of W. And so if you make, if you do it and you, and you add this one and you divide by two, you end up with what is written in the slide, that is uh, the matrix acting on this quantity here. and on the vector gradient phi of V minus gradient phi of W, DW, DV, which is uh, what is written here up to the sign. If I'm not mistaken. Well. Okay, uh, so now if you take for phi uh, a function which is constant, if you take phi of V is equal to one, then uh, you see that this is equal to zero, and so the integral of Q is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the first part here. Now if you take for phi of V, one of the components of V, that is for example VI, then you get here um, uh, a constant minus a constant, which is the same, so you still get zero. And you get that the second uh, line here is uh, equal to zero. And finally, if you take uh, phi of v is equal to modulus of v square over two, the gradient is equal to v, here the gradient is equal to w, so you end up with v minus w, and you must remember that this is a projection onto v minus w orthogonal. So this also gives you zero. So finally, you end up with this property of the kernel, which is something which was really imposed by Landau when he wrote down the kernel, in fact. That is, the, if you multiply by the mass, the momentum, or the kinetic energy, then you get zero. And this is just a sort of global version of the uh, fact that in each collision, uh, you have to keep the mass, the momentum, and the kinetic energy, okay? So this is directly related to the uh, conservation laws of physics. And this is already true in the case of the Boltzmann equation. So since this one is a limit of Boltzmann kernel, you can also recover it in this way. But there is a hidden um, extra uh, uh, law which is, uh, which is uh, uh, included in this, in this kernel, and this is uh, much less easy to see. And this is really, in fact, the idea of Boltzmann, that if you take as a test function the logarithm of f of v, so you, you take this formula here, and for phi, you take the logarithm of f. Then you get here, so if you take the logarithm of f, what you get here is gradient f divided by f, and here gradient f of w divided by f of w. And this is exactly the same as here if you put in, uh, in factor f of v times f of w. Okay, so you put in factor f of v times f of w, and you end up with the same term here and here. And here you have a non-negative symmetric matrix. So when it acts on the same vector on both sides, you get something which is uh, positive, okay? And uh, so this strange property exactly tells you that there is uh, uh, a quantity which we call entropy production, which is minus the integral of Q times the logarithm of F, which has a certain sign. And this is, of course, once you know what to do, it's very easy to check that, but at the time of Boltzmann, of course, it was extremely complicated to imagine that by multiplying by the logarithm of F, you would end up with something, okay? And this is really at, at the basis of the statistical uh, um, mechanics explanation of thermodynamics. 
Okay, so uh, uh, now let, let's see. Uh, so this, uh, by the way, this is called the H theorem of Boltzmann. Um, and let me say a few words about what happens in the case of equality. That is, now you suppose that this entropy uh, production, which is written here, is equal to zero. Then what can we say on F? So as you can see, since this term here is positive, or at least non-negative, and uh, this term here is also non-negative, up, up to supposing that f is not zero somewhere, this tells you that um, this quantity here has to be in the kernel of the matrix which is here. That is, this quantity here has to be parallel to v minus w. So another way of saying that is to say that the cross product of v minus w and this quantity is equal to zero. So you end up with a functional equation here, which happens to uh, have as a solution only the Gaussian function of V. It's quite easy to see that when F is a Gaussian function of V, then this quantity is equal to zero. Let me explain briefly how it works. If you take the gradient of this and you divide by F, what you get is exactly something which is affine with respect to V, okay? And then you take it at point V and you remove the same function at point W. So it's like if this quantity was linear in terms of V. So you get constant times V minus W and you take the cross product with V minus W and you get zero. Of course, if you want to prove that this implies this, it's much, it's much more complicated. And actually this was first proven by Boltzmann. If you suppose that F has extra regularity, like for example, if you suppose that logarithm of F is in C2, then you can take a certain number of derivatives of this quantity, and after some work, some algebraic work, you end up with this. Now there are modern uh, proofs in which you don't have to suppose that f is C2, and in fact, one can show that as soon as this is defined and equal to zero, then f is a Gaussian. So I don't want to say much more about this. But let me immediately say that what I will present now is a sort of quantitative statement that if this quantity is small, then F is close to a Gaussian, okay? So, thanks to those properties, um, it's possible to write down the so-called uh, entropy inequality for the solution of Landau's equation. So now you suppose that F is a solution of the specially homogeneous Landau equation, that is you have DF over DT is equal to Q of F, and you write down h of f as integral of f log f. So this is the negative of the physical entropy. And you compute, so d over dt of this quantity. And uh, since d over dt of f log f will give you uh, log f plus one times df over dt, uh, you end up with the integral of q of f times one plus log f. The one will give you zero when you integrate against q and the q of f times log f, and you take the integral. This is exactly the entropy production. So it gives you something which is non-positive. So as you can see, this exactly tells you that for this equation, the entropy is a Lyapunov functional, okay? So you have a natural Lyapunov functional appearing for the Landau equation, which comes out of physics. In terms of a priori estimate, this exactly means the following, that uh, if you write the previous inequality and now you integrate between time zero and capital T, then you can prove that uh, first, the supremum between uh, zero and time T of F times one V square over two and the modulus of the logarithm of M, which is basically the mass, the energy, and the entropy. So all of those, those quantities are bounded if they are initially bounded. So let's suppose that they are initially bounded then they, rem they will remain bounded for all time, okay? So you have a natural estimate in L infinity in time with value in L1 in V, and in fact in L log L in V. And you also have that the entropy production is in L1 in time, okay? This is a direct consequence of the previous inequality when you integrate between zero and T. Actually, uh, there is a some work to do in order to get the modulus of the logarithm here instead of the logarithm itself, but it's really not very difficult. So those are the a priori estimates which come out of physics. And in fact, 
uh, as we will see later, those are the only a priori estimates which are known in the case of the original Lando kernel with a Coulomb interaction, the one which is physically relevant. So you have somehow to build a theory starting from this, that is knowing only that S is in L infinity in time with value in L log L in V. So as I told you earlier, uh, it's much easier to produce a theory if you suppose that the function psi here is uh, a power which is big enough. So in the case of hard potentials, which means that gamma is uh, non-negative, uh, this was done in, the, in this uh, following series of papers. And um, let me say uh, that we know basically everything in this case. That is, moments and smoothness are created. And in fact, it's possible to show that uh, the smoothness is very good. It is Gevray, like in, like in, the, in, in the talk of uh, Professor Hundertmark uh, yesterday. And also, a large number of moments can be created. And I'll say a few more words about this later. Uh, in the case of Maxwell molecules, which corresponds to gamma equal to 0, uh, basically, the same can be, uh, can be shown. Uh, except that moments are propagated rather than created, and we don't really know if they are created or not. And if gamma is between uh, minus 2 and 0, uh, then uh, thanks to a very recent work by uh, Kung Sheng Wu in uh, 2014, it's possible to have a theory which is close to the theory for those two cases in which basically we can show that moments are still propagated and smoothness is created. So somehow the theory is very good as soon as gamma is bigger than minus two. But remember that the interesting case, the physical case corresponds to gamma is equal to minus three. So there is a gap between what is known and what we would like to know, okay? Uh, so in the case of the, of the Coulomb uh, uh, interaction, that is gamma is equal to minus three, there are a certain number of theories which I want to quote now. Uh, there is a theory of local in time solutions, which is due to Alexandre Liaolin, uh, once again, it's a very recent paper, and there was a previous paper by Fournier also. And then there is also another very beautiful theory, which is due to Yan Guo, um, of perturbative solutions in the spatially homogeneous case. Uh, perturbative means here that you start, from, um, you start from an initial datum, which is not far from a Gaussian. Okay, so basically you have solutions which are either for small times or close to a Gaussian. If you look for solutions uh, which are global, which are in the large, uh, then actually um, there are two papers which are now uh, uh, already uh, uh, old. The, the first one is maybe the most interesting for this talk. It's uh, the so-called paper on H solutions, which is due to Villani in 98. And this is based on the idea that Actually, um, if you just use those uh, a priori estimates, it will not be enough to, bid, to build uh, global solutions for the spatially homogeneous Landau equation in the Coulomb case because of singularities that you have in the coefficients of the parabolic equations. But if you add the control that you know on the entropy production, then it's possible somehow to write um, a weak formulation uh, which uses directly inside the entropy production, so it needs a, some algebra. And since you know that this entropy production is in L1 in T, you can all use this extra information in order to show existence of global solutions. So somehow those solutions are weak solutions, but they are in some sense weaker than traditional weak solutions because you really need to introduce the entropy production inside the definition of the weak solutions. So because of this, uh, Villani proposed to call them with a specific name, and he called them uh, H solutions. So you can conceive them as weaker than traditional weak distributional solutions, if you wish. And then there is also another uh, theory which is extremely interesting, but which I will not present at all, which is the theory of renormalized solution with defect measures. And uh, um, this is in the, this is a, let's say, a, um, an example in which you have to use the notion of renormalization of uh, Diperna and Lyons from uh, the paper on the Boltzmann equation in the 80s. And to add another idea, so you have also to add uh, defect measures uh, in order to produce extremely weak solutions in the 
especially in homogeneous case. So if you remember, in the case which interests us, which is a physical case, you have either perturbative solutions, which are uh, smooth but for specific initial data, or for small times, or you have these extremely weak uh, global solutions. So uh, what is now the strategy for getting better solutions? So let me first say that uh, many people have tried to start from the parabolic form and to find um, variants of the maximum principles, let's say, in order to produce, um, in order to produce better solutions for this, uh, for this case. And up to now, it has not worked. But of course, it does not mean that it will not work uh, at some point. So I think this is still uh, uh, a current line of research. Uh, but on my side, I rather decided to uh, take another, uh, an, another path. And uh, my idea was to say, let's use as much as possible the uh, information that we have on the entropy production, that is that this quantity is bounded in L1. And let's try to extract from it as much information as we can. And maybe if we, are, if we try hard enough, uh, we will show that actually F is in L1 in time with value in some uh, good space, let's say a space with a certain number of derivatives. So let me explain why there was a chance that this uh, could give something. So the reason for that is that actually this has been tried in other cases and the, the, the first one is something which was quoted yesterday uh, by Professor Hundert Mark in his talk, that is uh, this estimate here which concerns the entropy production of the Boltzmann equation, so I will not write it down. Let me just say that in a certain case, a case of, uh, 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 of, of the cross-section without angular cutoff, this was really described very precisely yesterday, um, then it's possible to show that the entropy production of the Boltzmann equation plus the mass and energy dominate somehow the, a certain Sobolev norm of the square root of f to the square. So if you, uh, so this was proven in fact in, 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 in a paper that uh, we wrote together with Raja Alexandre and Bernd Berg and Cédric Villani in 2000. And um, thanks to this, uh, you can do a certain number of things, but let's say this gives you somehow uh, the key to the smoothness properties of the Boltzmann equation. I think it was very clear in, in the talk by Professor Hundert Mark yesterday. Um, so we, we had, uh, I had in mind this, this result which was uh, already proven for the Boltzmann equation. But there is, let's say, one defect in this result. It is that here you get smoothness only on a given ball of a certain radius. So you don't really know what happens when for large V in this result. And that's really something which is not very good if you look at the, at the Landau equation. Actually, there is a second uh, result which is in the same direction and this is a, a work that I did also with uh, Cédric Villani in, uh, in 2000 and this concerns the Landau equation with Maxwell molecules. So it's a case which is much, much simpler. And in that case we knew that, uh, yeah, um, supposing that, the, that the, the functions are normalized like this, then it's really possible to show that the entropy dissipation, the entropy production, sorry, uh, of, the, of the Landau kernel in that case, in the case of Maxwell molecules, is bigger than a constant which depends only on things which are controlled, that is uh, basically the entropy, uh, times this quantity here, which is in fact a classical quantity of information theory which is known as the relative Fisher information of F with respect to a Gaussian. So this is something which naturally appears in information theory and we were able to prove this at that time. And uh, as you can see, if you know this, then you see that uh, since this will be L1 in time, you know that this quantity will be in L1 in time. And this is basically like gradient F to the square divided by F, that is gradient of square root of F to the square. So it's really the H1 norm of the square root of F. So you really dominate with the entropy production, 
something which is associated to the smoothness of f. That is the h1 norm of square root of f. So it's really something that I wanted to prove also for the case, for the physical case. Okay. So in order to understand uh, how it works, let me explain uh, in, in, in a few words uh, how it was possible to prove this. Actually, there were two proofs in this paper. And the first proof is an exact computation which can be done only in this very specific case of Maxwell molecules, in which, in fact, the kernel um, simplifies a lot. And it's really possible to write it uh, if you suppose that you have the normalization that I, that I, that I propose in the, in the proposition. Actually, you can write the kernel as, as a completely linear kernel. In some sense, the normalization kills the quadratic uh, aspect of the, of the kernel. And so you can write it in this way. Here you have exactly the Fokker-Planck, the linear Fokker-Planck uh, operator. Here you have the laplace beltrami operator on the sphere. And here you have an operator which I don't want to describe too much, but basically it's something which works on the secant momentum of F. And in some way it's a sort of physiotropization uh, uh, kernel which looks a little like this one. So you can write the Landau kernel in that specific case of Maxwell molecules as something which is much more simple. And then you can uh, sort of try to work independently on those three things. So this, actually, this exact computation is due to Villani. It was already present in a, in a paper, in a, in a former paper of Villani in 1998. Yeah, so this is just the contracted product of the, of the matrix here and the uh, second, the Haitian matrix of F. Yes, it's just the trace of the product of the two matrices. Yeah. Uh, but actually, I really prefer a second method, which in fact um, uh, was uh, uh, devised um, uh, uh, by uh, Cédric and myself uh, at that time, but it was in fact based on, on a very old paper that I wrote in uh, 89, um, in, in which, uh, let's say at that time, I, I was more looking for a sort of quantitative version of what I told you earlier about the case of equality in the H theorem, that is, try to see the if it's possible to make quantitative the idea that the cross product of V minus W and gradient F divided by F of V minus the same quantity of W equal to zero implies that F is a Maxwellian. So this paper, this old paper was based on, on this, uh, uh, was trying to solve this question, let's say. And uh, actually, so uh, um, looking at this paper again in 2000, um, we ended up with this idea which now I will, I will try to describe. So actually, uh, once again, in this specific case of the Maxwell molecules, you can write the entropy production in this way. So you have here a double sum on, 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 the, on the indices of the, uh, of, on the components, if you wish. And here you have f of v times f of w times the, the square of this quantity. And this quantity is exactly the cross product of V minus W and gradient F of F taken at point V minus the same quantity taken at point W, and you take the, all the components of this cross product, okay? So uh, uh, for all A and J, which are not equal. And you can really write the, the, the entropy production in this way, uh, because somehow you can guess that it works because somehow the, uh, to project onto the orthogonal of V minus W is really direct, rela directly related to taking cross products, okay? This is related to the elementary formula, uh, okay, that you, 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 you have for two vectors. Uh, so, okay. Something like this. So if you take this minus this, this is exactly taking the projection, you end up really with the cross product, okay? And so somehow, you, as you can see, uh, if you want to show that this dominates somehow a quantity like this, which appears naturally in the Fisher information, um, 
you are in a situation in which uh, you know that uh, you control somehow this quantity because this will be in L1 in T and you want to control this one. And you know how to define Q in terms of the gradient F divided by F, but somehow what you need is a, is a reverse. Somehow you have to write this quantity in terms of Q because what you control is Q. Okay? And so the whole idea is to invert this formula here in, in some way. And actually, uh, one can write a certain number of uh, integrations with respect to W of this, of this quantity here and end up with a system, with a linear system. And then you can solve it thanks to Kramer's formula. And when you do that, you end up with this formula here. So as you can see, this is quite complicated formula with uh, two determinants because it's, it's Kramer's formula. And the Q uh, appears inside here. And here you have a, a large number of things appearing inside, but that's not really important. The important thing is that you can really write this in terms of Q. And thanks to this, uh, you can really bound the Fisher information, which is related to this, thanks to this. Okay. So maybe just remember this vague idea that you have to invert these things. So I will not say more about this. And now I would like to present the estimate that uh, I obtained recently. So now this is for the real uh, Lando operator with Coulomb interaction. So this is the real stuff in some sense, uh, the one which appears in physics. And what we are able to prove is that this dominates this quantity here, which is still the gradient of the square root of f to the square, so the h1 norm to the square of the square root of f. But now you have a weight which appears and which is somehow unavoidable because, uh, I mean, this is related to the fact that the uh, Coulomb potential is, uh, is decaying very slowly at infinity. So because of this, you have to have this uh, bad weight when v is large. And so somehow, uh, now we have this extra uh, estimate. And since we know that this quantity will be in L1 in time, we will know that the, for the solution of the spatially homogeneous Landau equation with the Coulomb interaction, this quantity will also be in L1 in time. And this is one extra a priori estimate. So let me say that the proof, I will of course say almost nothing about the proof, just let me say that the proof is an extension of the second proof that we knew how to do in the case of Maxwell molecules. And now the main, the main change is that in the Kramer formula, you have to use extra weights here, which in fact, in the, which in fact are Gaussians. And uh, so this adds a lot of extra technical difficulties, but at the end, let's say, the whole point is that you can really uh, extend the proof in this, in this case. So let me now um, describe in 10 minutes what are the applications of uh, this new uh, estimate uh, on the uh, Landau equation. So the first one is the following. I have defined here what are the weighted LP spaces and the weighted H1 space, but this is really what you can imagine. Um, so the proposition is the following. Now let's take an initial datum which has finite mass, energy, and entropy. And let's take an H solution uh, of the equation. And we know that those exist thanks to the work of Villani of uh, 98. Then this H solution will, be, will have the following property. The square root of F will lie in L2 in time with value in this weighted H1 space in V and F itself will be in L1 in time with value in L3 in V, so uh, with a weight. So the, the novelty is that we knew that F was in L infinity in time with value in L log L, and now we know that it is also in L1 in time with value in L3, okay? So we have an extra uh, uh, estimate at this level. So let me uh, very briefly explain how it works. We know that the entropy production is in L1 in time, so that thanks to the estimate between the entropy production and the uh, Fisher information, we know that this quantity is in fact bounded. And then you use a Sobolev embedding. And in dimension three, H1 will be in L6. 
And since it is for the square root of f, you will end up with f in L3. Okay? And you end up at the end with f in L3 up to a certain weight in V. So that is the first, uh, that is the first consequence. And as you can see, now we have, thanks to these estimates, it's really possible to prove that f is a standard weak solution. So we come back, in some sense, from H solution, we come back to the standard uh, weak uh, formulation of the equation, the distributional form formulation of the equation, let's say. Uh, the second uh, application is that, in fact, moments are propagated. So by moments, I mean quantities like this, that is polynomial moments um, for F. So uh, once again, you take the spatially homogeneous Lando equation uh, for the Coulomb interaction, and you take an H solution. If initially you know that the uh, initial datum has K moments, uh, this will remain true uh, forever. But actually, this, uh, this proposition was improved a lot uh, recently by uh, Carapatoso and Hay. And what they were able to prove is that, in fact, uh, in this propagation, you can really control um, how the norms the, uh, uh, the norms, the L1, L norms, that is L1 norms of the moments, are increasing with time. And in fact, it's possible to show that they increase like T at most. And this, the, the important thing here is that this polynomial here is independent on, of L. That is, all different moments can increase. They are not necessar necessarily bounded with time, but they all increase at the same speed. Uh, and then there was yet another uh, improvement. And here I would like to say uh, two more words about this because this is really uh, connected to, to the talk of uh, Professor Hundertmark. That is, now you look at exponentially weighted moments like this. And uh, actually there, there, is, uh, there has been long theory on, on those moments for the, for the Boltzmann equation. And I have quoted here a certain number of papers. All of them are not here, but uh, 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 there is a, a paper by Bobilev, Gamba, Panferov, one by Michler Mouo, one by Alonso Lotz, and one by Alonso Canizo, Gamba Mouo, in which you have basically almost all the theory. Uh, also the theory in the case in which uh, you have uh, a Boltzmann operator in which you have some dissipation, like the operator appearing in, in granular gases. Uh, and uh, so Carapatoso and Hay were able to produce an extension of those results in this precise case of the Lando equation with the Coulomb interaction. And actually, their theorem runs like this. So basically, all those things are propagated and uh, do not increase more than 1 plus t, provided that the s here is not too big, so it has to be between 0 and 1 half, or if it is exactly 1 half, k has to be between 0 and 1 half also. So a large number of uh, uh, stretch exponentials moments are uh, propagated. A third application is, consists in looking at this result in the moderately soft potentials case. This was treated by Wu uh, last year. And actually, thanks to these new estimates, if you do it not on the Coulomb interaction, but in, in this case, you can recover most of the results of, uh, of Wu. So in some sense, it gives a, a second proof of the results which can be found in the, in the paper of Wu. Um, and I would like also to present the last application. So this one is really for the large time behavior of the equation. So actually, what we are able to prove together with Kleber Carapatoso and Ling Binghe was the following. Now, if you, if you start with an initial datum, which is in this space, and we know that this quantity will be propagated, so is the reason why, of course, we, we take it, and which has an entropy. Uh, suppose that the initial datum is normalized. Then it's possible to show that F uh, will, uh, if you compare F and the Gaussian, actually, I forgot about the 2 pi divided, uh, 2 pi to the 3 half, sorry. And also, this is an L1 norm, which I also forgot. Uh, then this quantity decreases like this function here, which is basically like exponential minus t to the 1 over 7. So you have an, a, a convergence which is not exponential, but which is better than any polynomial, okay? which is already not that bad. Uh, 
Um, let me say that this is based on the so-called entropy-entropy production method, which is a quite elementary method based on the idea that you can make quantitative Lasalle's principle. So let me, say, let me say in a few words how it works. Suppose that you have an abstract equation, DTF equal to AF, and that you have a Lyapunov functional, that is when you, you have something which has its value in R, and when you take D over DT of this quantity when F is a solution of the equation, you get something which is non-positive. And suppose that you control the case of equality, that is, you know that AF is equal to zero exactly when H is minimal, and this corresponds to F equal to a certain F infinity. So suppose that you know the case of equality in the Lyapunov uh, setting. Then if you want to have a quantitative Lassalle's principle, that is something which tells you that F minus F infinity at time T will be like exponential minus T, you just have to prove that somehow that D of F is bigger than a constant times H of F minus H of F infinity. So you have to find a relationship between the entropy production and the entropy itself. Because if you know that, as you can see, you can replace this in the inequality here and use Grunewald's lemma and exactly get that this quantity decreases like an exponential, okay? Then it happens that in the case when the entropy is a standard physical entropy, that is integral of F log F, and, you, and everything is normalized, um, this, the difference between the entropies also dominates the L1 norm of F minus uh, the equilibrium to the square. This is called the Kshishar Kulbak inequality, and it's a very standard inequality in information theory. And it's not very difficult to prove, it's completely elementary. So, after uh, all in all, what happens is that if you have found a relationship between the entropy dissipation and the entropy itself, you end up with an exponential decay for the difference between F and the equilibrium. So this is a completely abstract theory. And the important point here is that what you're looking for is a, differential, is, a, is a functional inequality which has nothing to do with the original equation. So you can, at this level, you can forget completely about the equation and you just look at something which is satisfied for all functions f, or more precisely, for all functions f which are in a certain set and you hope that then that this set is conserved in the evolution of the equation, okay? So what is really uh, appealing in this method is that somehow you can forget about the original PDE and just look for a functional equation, functional inequality. Okay, so in fact, there are many, many variants of this general method and uh, most of the time, instead of having H of F minus H of F infinity itself, you have a certain function of it and usually it is multiplied by things which depend on F and which may be sometimes bounded in the evolution of the equations, but also sometimes it's, all, it's just increasing in a controlled way when you look at the evolution of the equation. So here typically, in the case which interests me, you have those moments which grow like one plus t, and so you would end up here with things which are polynomial in t. And then you have to use a variant of the Grunewald lemma, which does not give you exponential, but usually stretch exponential as we saw in the, in the proposition. Okay, so uh, I think I can finish in the, in the last two minutes. <laughs> so the point now is, um, to have this entropy, this link between entropy production and entropy. And actually, this is obtained by a variant of the inequality that I proposed for the study of smoothness. In this variant, you have this extra term which appears here, that is a certain moment of F. This is the seventh moment of F which appears here. And uh, the, the main difference with the original inequality is now that you have this plus V here instead of just the gradient F to the square divided by F. And thanks to this plus V, you can relate this term to the difference of the entropy and the entropy of the equilibrium. So for those of you who may know um, the theory of the logarithmic Sobolev inequality, actually this is a typical quantity which appears when you look at the logarithmic Sobolev in inequality. This is the 
relative fissure information of F with respect to the Gaussian. Here you have a weight. And actually, there is uh, a variant of the original Sobolev logarithmic inequality of growth, which is due to Bakri and Emery, uh, which was proven, I think, in the 80s. So this was, uh, Bakri and Emery are probabilists, so this was written in the probabilistic uh, vocabulary, but you can really translate it completely in the uh, analysis vocabulary. And um, this inequality basically tells you that this variant of the Fisher information with a weight dominates somehow a certain function of the relative entropy of F and the entropy of the Gaussian. So thanks to this and a large number of interpolations that I don't want to comment, but there are, you, you need a lot of interpolations which are really uh, a nightmare. Like typically you have to uh, look at F log F with exponential moment and try to interpolate this between uh, another exponential moment of F itself and F in L3 with a weight. So as you can see, F log F, you can interpolate it between F and F to the cube. And this you can interpolate between, let's say, uh, a decreasing weight and, and another exponential weight, and you have to play with that. And, uh, well, it's possible to, to manage all of this. And so, thanks to all those different ingredients, you can end up with this uh, estimate on the large time behavior of the uh, spatially, homo spatially homogeneous Lando equation for the Coulomb interaction. So all of this is related to the generalization of the Cherchignani's conjecture and uh, the first uh, proof of the original conjecture is due to Toscani and Villani. It was about 15 years ago. And then there were generalization by Villani and thanks to this proof there is yet another generalization in different directions which I don't want to explain too much. Let me finish by uh, concluding uh, and explaining what is still open in, in this direction. So from my point of view, the main issue now is to try to get uh, still better estimates than F in L1 with value in L3, uh, L1 in time with value in L3 in V for this uh, Lando equation in the Coulomb case. Remember that you can interpolate with L infinity with value in L log L, so you have a large number of estimates. But still, this is not sufficient to prove uniqueness uh, up to now. Actually, there is a paper by Fournier in which it's shown that if we knew that F was L1 in time with value in L infinity in V, then uniqueness would hold. So there is still a large gap uh, between L3 and L infinity to get uniqueness. So we are still far from having uh, a world post problem in the usual sense, in the Hadamard sense, in this case. So that is, from my point of view, the main issue. Another issue, which is maybe a little less important, is that um, the, uh, if you look at the linearized theory, um, you can guess what is the optimal rate of convergence towards equilibrium. And actually, it's not exponential in that case, and this has been known since, I think, uh, the works by Kaflisch in the early 80s. Um, but it's still much better than exponential of minus t to the one divided by seven. So it should be something like exponential minus t to some power, which is intermediate between one over seven and one. And uh, so we have no real idea now how to improve what we know. And this is related to those strange in, um, uh, uh, interpolation inequalities which are probably not optimal in what we did. So there is still room to improve things here. We don't know really yet how to do it uh, now. So from my point of view, those are now really the two main uh, problems which remain to solve in this direction. And I think I will really stop here for the... Thanks a lot. <laughs>